Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you that you're our God and that you care so much about us. And we, Lord, as we gather together to worship you and to hear from you this morning as we go through your word, may you minister to our hearts and, and just draw us close to you. Keep our hearts soft and sensitive to the things you want us to do, Lord. And Father, as always, as we worship you, we want to honor you. And Lord, may these songs just speak to our heart and encourage us. We thank you, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, morning, everyone. If we could open up our Bibles this morning. We're reading out of Psalm 63 today, where we are told this, O God, you are my God, early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you. In a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God, everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak Lie shall be stopped. Amen. You know, um, before I bring Jim up here, people want to know, you know, where we're at on God's prophetic time clock. And I always tell people, look at Israel. Look at the Jewish people. If you want to know what time it is, focus on what's going on over there because that's who God is going to be working with during the tribulation period. Not the church. We're gone. We're home with the Lord. And so I am so thankful to have Jim Fletcher uh, here this morning um, and just share about Israel. Because if you've noticed, more and more nations are turning against us. Surprise, surprise, even our own nation. But it's what the Bible says. Keep your eyes on what's going on there and keep your eyes on the Lord. So let's welcome Jim with uh, Calvary Chapel. Welcome. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I really am glad to be here, very glad. I met uh, Joe and Julie yesterday at the conference in Appleton, and um, I was so excited when I found out I was going to get to see Lake Michigan. <laughs> uh, back home in Arkansas, we have a lot of lakes, but they're all man-made, and so uh, this has been great. And I also applaud Dwight for continuing to focus on prophecy and, and teaching people uh, about Israel. I was thinking about this talk after they uh, invited me, and the, the title Israel Alone came to me because, as Joe said, Israel traditionally has had few friends, and today they have fewer friends and less all the time. And, you know, these things ebb and flow. Um, President Trump, of course, was a great friend to the Israelis. Um, but Israel's protection doesn't depend on who's in office. And, and so what I want to focus on today and, and tell a couple of stories that I think illustrate this is that 
being alone isn't always a bad thing. Um, the Israelis are alone diplomatically, militarily, that sort of thing. But we are living in the time when God is going to reveal himself in their aloneness. Because if you read a lot of the prophetic books, particularly the end of the book of Zechariah, you see that at the time of the very end, when a lot of these famous prophecies find their fulfillment, the Israelis have no one in their corner. And uh, growing up, I was privileged to have believing parents. Both sets of grandparents were believers. And so I was always taught that Scripture is true, all of it, all of it. And in particular, uh, my family has always loved Israel. And I was able to uh, visit there for the first time in 1998, and uh, it just gripped me and, and still does. So when I think about these things, as I do often, you know, I said yesterday, I'm not an emotional person, but I get emotional when I think about God's provision for the Jewish people because it's there to see if you're willing to look. And so I want to start with some scripture. And by a happy accident yesterday, blessing in disguise, I'm probably losing PowerPoint from now on. Uh, <laughs> We worked out ahead of time. We, yeah, we got the right cable. It's going to work. We ran through it. Everything's fine. I got to speak and no PowerPoint. And so, oh, I got to rely on the Bible alone. <laughs> so, uh, but it was great, you know, and it, it's, it's very freeing, actually. So we're going to do it that way. I don't have any slides to show you, but hopefully I can paint a little bit of a picture for you about what I want to talk about. And in this presentation, the theme that I want to hit, and I want you to remember and I want you to take away from this, is in the story of Israel, in that narrative, you can see how God makes provision for you, okay? We live in a self-centered culture. It's not always good to make it about yourself, but sometimes you can. And in this instance, I think it's, it's instructive. There are a lot of hopeless people in our country today. And there are hopeless people in the church. Um, in, in any room of any size, everybody's got problems. A friend of mine said once, we all have the same five problems. Um, and we're dealing with things that seem insurmountable. I've been there myself. And, uh, and yet, if you hear about how God has provided for his chosen people, the Jews, throughout their history, I hope you'll come away strengthened in your faith and that you won't forget it. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse, verses 26 to 29, and I love the heading in, in this uh, section, the everlasting arms of the eternal God. The text says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Um, in Deuteronomy, 3,700 years ago, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, God gave them the whole sweep of their history in one speech. He told them exactly what was going to happen to them. He told them what their response would be. He said, this is going to be my response. Not all of that was a good story. But he concluded by telling them, in the end of days, 
he would bring them back to the land that he had promised their forefathers, and they would dwell there forever. Now, we can either rely on the promises of God or we can't, and it's a choice to believe or not. I believe he means exactly what he says, and he's been faithful at every marker along the highway. There is, uh, if, if, I get, if I get too long-winded, I'll tell one story, but if I can keep it respectful, I'll tell two. These are among my favorite stories. I call them modern Bible stories because they are examples of how God has made provision for and protected the people of Israel in the face of insurmountable odds, okay? That's the key insurmountable odds. So, again, think about your own life. If you're going through something right now <clears throat> that's so difficult that it seems unsolvable, I want you to remember these stories, and I mean it. I want you to remember how God has protected his people when they were in mortal danger. So, in 1980. Actually, 1980, the head of the Mossad, Israel's spy agency, went to Menachem Begin, the prime minister, and he said, Mr. Prime Minister, the Iraqis, Saddam Hussein, is building a nuclear reactor in their western desert, and it's pointed at us. Now, the Iraqis, of course, said it's for purely peaceful purposes. Uh, but when a, a big gun is pointed at you, you know, you, you can question that. And so the Israelis understood that it was an offensive weapon that would be used against them at some point. So Begin, who happened to be at that time a really strong leader, Begin was, I think until Netanyahu, the only Israeli prime minister that had Bible study in the prime minister's residence. Begin was very friendly with evangelical leaders that, that loved Israel. And he was, he was a biblical guy. Didn't believe exactly like we do, but he had an awareness. And he certainly was aware that the God of his forefathers was still active. And so he was faced with this dilemma what do we do about this reactor if we don't do anything? And that was the easy short-term call to make, right? Obviously. That's what most leaders do. Kick the can down the road. I don't want to deal with it. Very, very, very rare men deal with it. And Begin called in his cabinet, and he called in the head of the Air Force, and they talked about it. And the cabinet, as they usually are, was kind of split on what they should do. The ones that did not want to do it, including the great uh, defense minister, Moshe Dayan, uh, th their reasoning for not launching an operation against the reactor was that it would hurt them internationally in diplomacy. Um, That's, that's usually your first mistake in decision-making because the truth is your ideological enemies are, are often bluffing. You know, remember when Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in, in 2017? What did you heard from presidents for decades? Oh, it'll inflame the Arab street. There'll be a war. There'll be a holy war in the Middle East. They moved the embassy. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Bullies bluff. Their bluff, you're okay. So Begin decided to green light an operation to take out that reactor. And the way they were going to do it, they decided to send uh, a group of uh, uh, eight F-16 fighters, each equipped with two 2,000-pound bombs. Now, the Israelis are hyper-intelligent, scary smart, and no detail escapes their attention. 
So they knew that, you know, this was a thousand mile flight. Too far to refuel. And so they dropped everything off these planes that, that they didn't need. And they, they fixed the fuel tanks so that when they were empty, their outside fuel tanks, they would just jettison them into the desert. Now, like with an operation like this, and they've done this kind of thing before, they calculated the human cost. And they knew that they would lose pilots. They knew they would lose planes. They hoped that they could ditch in Jordan and that King Hussein would you know, be somebody they could, they could bargain with. So they chose the, uh, the commander of this operation, a, a guy named uh, Zev Rav, and, and they called him in. And in Israel, they have an interesting structure politically and, and militarily. Um, I mean, the prime minister will make a final call, but everybody on the team has real input. And so a junior level officer can, in effect, overrule the defense minister. And so they decided that, you know, among the thousand details they had to, uh, to figure out was uh, when to go in. So they had to escape Jordanian, Saudi, and Iraqi radar. Um, what they actually ended up doing on, on the, the mission was when they were flying over Saudi airspace, they spoke as Jordanian pilots on the radio. <laughs> and when they were over Jordanian airspace, they spoke as Saudi pilots, including Saudi accent. Um, but, but the timing was the critical thing, and so the obvious time is do it at night. So that's what they decided to do. They would go in at night so at least the anti-aircraft teams couldn't see them as easily. But Raz said, no, if we're going to do this, the optimum time is in the daylight so we can see the target. They can see us but we have to be able to see them. And the, and the, the brass said, well, you can't do that. You can't go in at, you know, you're exposing yourself. And uh, he insisted. Because over there, they will give their life for the nation. Unequivocally. So they decided to go in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Isn't that amazing? So 16 men, eight planes, and they had fighter escorts with them. Now, when they uh, were flying toward the target, King Hussein of Jordan was in the Gulf of Aqaba in his yacht. And the guy looks up, and he sees a cluster of planes with the Mog and David on the wing. And he says, uh-oh. <laughs> and he had been a semi-friend of the Israelis, uh, the closest thing they would have to a friend, but he wasn't a friend that day because he called the Iraqis. And he said, you got somebody coming in your back door. And... Uh, But they were slow to respond. <laughs> and uh, so by the time they were approaching the target, it was getting very close. Those planes flew 100 feet off the surface of the desert so they could escape the radar. And the Iraqis were blind. They didn't know they were coming. They didn't know where they were. When they got over the target, they dropped the loads, and uh, I've read that anywhere from 8 to 14 of the bombs were a direct hit on the reactor at Osiric. And so today, if you were there, 
the reactor is still there, and it's just still a big pile of cement and twisted metal. And they never threatened Israel again with that weapon. Now, the end of the story is the best, actually, because, you know, people always ask me, well, well, aren't the Israelis, they're not really religious, are they? They don't believe in God, that kind of thing. And, and a lot of them don't. But you know what? A lot of us don't. Every country has people that don't believe in God. But as usual, they want to pick out the Jews and, you know, criticize them. The answer is some of them do, and even the ones that don't. And I've talked to a lot of Israeli military personnel over the years. And to a man, I'm convinced they're aware that God watches over them. They may not say so, but they believe. They know. They know that as good as they are and as good as their capabilities are, they're not that good. Because as I said yesterday, in the face of just continual peril since the 40s and one war after another, all Israel does is win. Win, 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 win. How do you explain that? You can't explain it apart from the Lord holding them in the palm of his hand. So on the return flight, and they didn't lose a plane. They didn't lose a man. Not a scratch. They jettisoned those tanks. They had enough fuel to get back, which is virtually impossible. But as they were coming back into uh, Israeli airspace, um, and, and this is this is. It makes me cry to think about it. They were flying so fast, you know, in a jet, that on the western horizon, the sun looked like it was fixed in the sky. And Raz radioed to each of the crew, crews, and he read this. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still upon Gibeon. And thou, moon, in the valley of Ailon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. And then they landed back at base. If you don't believe God is real, you're not paying attention. You don't want to believe. Begin had not phoned President Reagan and told him about the, the operation. And Reagan, who was probably one of the most genuinely warm friends Israel had, was pretty mad. And so were his advisors, because his advisors didn't love Israel. And there was a lot of international community of, uh, criticism, of course. And as usual, the French were upset. It was their reactor they sold the Iraqis. <laughs> But nothing happened to Israel because a God-fearing prime minister greenlit an impossible operation to eliminate the threat. The, uh, the second story is, uh, is one that it is my favorite story. And uh, 
I think in it you'll also understand that apart from acknowledging the Lord of history, you can't come up with a reason why this was also a win for Israel. Um, before I do that, I want to read another passage from Scripture. This is uh, the book of Isaiah, the great Isaiah, uh, maybe the greatest writer in history. <laughs> I love the beauty of the language. This is the the Lord speaking to the Jewish people. Uh, Actually, 25 and 26. But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. And I will feed them that oppress me, thee with their own flesh. And they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So we learn a lot in those, those two verses. One is a terrible end will befall Israel's enemies. And it always has in history, uh, from Haman to Hitler, they all meet a violent end. Um, That's why ultimately I'm not overly concerned about Israel's enemies today. Uh, Among them are those in the White House and the State Department. Because make no mistake, and let's not mince words, they hate the Jewish people. Obama hates Israel. But if you read history, you can relax a little bit. I do. If you can remember, my memory is not what it used to be, but I can still remember most things. But if you remember the accounts Uh, that I've talked about and and others that many are found in Scripture where God intervened to save His people, you shouldn't anymore, I don't think, worry so much about your own situation, right? Because think about this. If God does things on such a big scale with the Jews, Osiric, Entebbe, Six-Day War, Yom Kippur War, etc., 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 Don't you think he can handle your problems? You have financial problems? Go to the Lord in prayer. Tell him you need help. He'll help you. Remember, uh, I'm digressing a minute, Uh, Matthew 11, 28. One of my favorite verses, because I've actually used this myself. I used this once. In a, in a situation that was unsolvable for me. And I spent a long time trying to reconcile this thing, and I couldn't. And one night, I was laying in bed, staring at the ceiling again, and I thought of Matthew eleven twenty eight, It's where Jesus is talking, and he, you know, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I thought... Do I believe that or not? And so I told Jesus that I I believe you. I said, I believe you. I I have to have your help. I have to. And he did. And I didn't solve my problem, but he did. Not overnight, but he took it away. So... Remember these things when you are crippled with anxiety. And, and you know how it is. We tell friends and family, I'm fine. I'm good. Good. Good day. And you're not. Remember the things we talked about today. Um, five years before the Osiric raid, Israel faced another very difficult situation. In those days, in the 70s, 
and I was a kid then, and I actually remember these. It was popular for terrorists to hijack airplanes, right? It was going on all the time in Europe, in Israel. And, uh, you know, it was always some revolutionary group of young people or whatever, and... Uh, and so this particular time, this was in the summer of 1976. And there are a few of you in here that will remember the Entebbe raid hostage rescue. So uh, it was about a week, actually a week before the 4th of July here. We celebrate our bicentennial. <clears throat> and uh, so in late June, there was a, a plane traveling from... Uh, Tel Aviv and Israel to Paris, about 300 people on board. And they stopped to refuel in Athens. And, uh, you know, in those days, security was a little bit lax. And so as soon as the plane got back in the air and was headed for Paris, some terrorists stood up and, and produced weapons, they had guns. And, uh, so they, they made their way to the cockpit, and the usual th stuff went on. And, and, uh, but this time they told the, the pilot, it was a French, French airliner, French pilot. And I, I made fun of the French a minute ago, but I want to I wanna say that through this entire ordeal, the French crew would not leave the passengers when they were, they were given a chance at freedom, and they wouldn't take it. Um, so, you know, a lot of times these, these hijackings, they would fly to a, a close airport or fly back to the one they'd just come from or whatever. It wasn't a long distance. But the Israelis in particular had gotten very good at, at foiling these things. Um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Ehud Barak, who would be future prime ministers, were uh, involved in a couple of these things, and they, in one of them, they posed as flight crew uh, mechanics with white coveralls and uh, nobody ever accused the terrorists of being overly smart and so they let them on the plane and as soon as they let them on the plane they shot them <laughs> uh, so you know but eventually they they learned to to modify their tactics and so this time they told them to fly south and uh, really far south and they eventually landed in uh, mi the middle of Africa, an uh, African country called Uganda. And it was at a town called Entebbe. And so it, over the course of a day or two, it, it, was, uh, it was PLO terrorists, the usual suspects, you know, as they say. Those guys are just killers. Yasser Arafat was always, always a mass murder and serial killer. Bill Clinton had him 13 times in the Lincoln bedroom in the White House. The guy was just a bloodthirsty killer. So it was the PLO and some, and, and some German terrorists. And you know, the Germans have a pretty bad track record with the Jews. And, and actually, at one point, they, they lined all the passengers up and, and separated the Jews from everybody else. And, and some of the Jewish passengers were Holocaust survivors and they thought, can this be happening again? We were separated at Auschwitz, I'm being separated again 30 years later, but they did. So they kept about 105 of the Jewish passengers, let everybody else go. <clears throat> but as soon as some of those people were freed and got back to where they were, Israeli agents were <clears throat> knocking on their door to gather intelligence. And uh, because, <clears throat> you know, 2,500 miles away is too far to launch a rescue. And that's why the terrorists did it, of course. And their demands were they wanted, I think it was 58 terrorists released from prisons in Europe, in Israel. Now, the Israelis had always made it a policy not to negotiate with terrorists. Um, but they were in a real bind this time because of the number of passengers and because the passengers' families 
were camped outside the prime minister's residence in the Knesset a day and night protesting. You do whatever you have to do. If they want to negotiate, negotiate. Just get our family back. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin was prime minister at the time. Uh, yesterday I mentioned he had been the architect of Israel's battle plan in the Six-Day War. So he was seasoned, but this was, this was a lot of pressure. Uh, political pressure, military pressure, emotional pressure. And so once again, the cabinet uh, met. And uh, as it happened, just as Zev Rav had, had commanded this uh, operation in Iraq, there was another Israeli Air Force pilot named Joshua Shani. And he was talking to some of his people, and he said, you know, uh, we might be able to do something here. And so, on the on, no pun intended, on the fly, they started brainstorming, you know, how would we actually do this? And so he proposed that they send uh, transport planes to Entebbe. Uh, this time they would go in at night. And uh, Shimon Perez was defense minister at the time. He would be later prime minister and things. And here's another interesting thing about how God works. God uses people. He uses whoever he wants to use. They don't have to be the right person at the time. Shimon Peres later became one of the most ineffective politicians in modern history. The guy was so left-wing, it hurt to watch him. And yet, he was defense minister at this time. Just as Levi Eshkol was prime minister in the Six-Day War, not the strongest knife in the box, but he led them to this miraculous victory. So Perez was going to have to be the one to make the call, do we take this to the cabinet and even present it to them? Well, if, if you're talking about the, the Shimon Perez of 1995, he's not going to do that. But the Shimon Perez of 1976 did. And he met with these lower-level officers, and he said, show me what... Uh, what you think we can be can be done. So within about I think it took them three or four days, four days, to actually have an operational plan that might work. And the the basic thing was, as I said, they're gonna send these uh transport planes over. A couple of them be loaded with commandos one would be loaded with Galani infantry, and one was a hospital ship. So in their, in their preparation for this, in their planning and discussion, the cabinet guesstimated that they would take 20 to 25% casualties, just the military. They knew that the hostages were kept in a middle hall at the airport. And so, you know, you're talking 40, 50 guys killed and wounded. But even with those odds, they actually decided to approve it. And uh, Perez wanted to see them run through it at their base. And so they, they built a makeshift terminal building out of canvas and wood. And he wanted to see the planes take off and land. They were going to have to land uh, at night. Um, basically, the pilots would have to land them manually. And, and the, the thinking was, if we can convince the Ugandan guards and the terrorists that we are commercial airliners, this thing might come off. If not, it's going to be a disaster. And so uh, there still had to be one group that was going to actually assault the terminal building. And so they selected the best they had. They have a, a, a counterterrorism unit called uh, Syriot Matkal, 
the unit, General Staff Reconnaissance Unit. And uh, these, these are like our Delta Force, um, the best of the best. And at, at that moment in the summer of 1976, the commander of the unit happened to be Jonathan Netanyahu. It's uh, Benjamin's older brother, uh, a legendary fighter in Israel. In fact, uh, Shani saw him at base one time, and he was talking with a friend, and, and uh, Jonathan walked by, and Shani said, there goes the greatest fighter Israel's ever had. Um, so the, the, there was a 30-man uh, team there with the unit, and everybody, of course, had a role. And uh, uh, Jonathan, or uh, Yoni, you know, Yonatan is the Hebrew, so his nickname was Yoni, Johnny. He spent a couple of nights, I mean, he didn't sleep anymore after that. And he was going over every detail of this operation. So they wanted to land as commercial airliners, and they... Uh, they had the foresight to, uh, they knew that Idi Amin, that crazy dictator in Uganda, the guy used to throw people off buildings and feed them to crocodiles. He was, a, he was a psychopath. He was the one that was in charge of these hostages, his airport, his country. So the Israelis were smart enough. They knew that Amin, from their intelligence, they knew that he, he had visited the hostages a couple of times. He'd just, he just drive in, have, uh, have his... Uh, team driving in in his black Mercedes, and uh, so the Israelis found a Mercedes on their own base. It was the only one in the country they could find. It was white. It wasn't black. So they spray painted it black, and they, they fashioned cardboard license plates, Ugandan license plates, and put on this thing, and they had to do a lot of mechanical work. They had some mechanics working on it. The starter wouldn't work. They didn't know if the thing would start when they got to Uganda. But they did this, and they said later that when the planes landed, that paint was still drying on the car. And Yoni and uh, three members of the unit were in that car, and they were the, they were the lead vehicle. Um, so what they did, they, they, the plan was to land at the, about a mile from the terminal, and everything came off without a hitch. Can you believe that? Um, about 15 years ago, I met two of the guys that went. And uh, one of them that I wanted to meet was the guy that was the first one in the door. And he said, you know, everything had to go right that night. If we had had one thing go wrong, it would have all blown apart. And it would have been a disaster for Israel in every way, including diplomatically. But he said everything went right. And he said the one thing that we had to have above all else was the element of surprise. And he said, do you know, the terrorists didn't know what was happening until I was in the doorway. They calibrated it that fine. You, you probably have surmised that the operation was a success, probably still the most successful rescue operation in history, and is studied in war colleges around the world. The Israelis did exactly what they planned to do. Uh, they were offloading vehicles from the first plane as that plane was taxiing the other way. They just dropped the door and the Mercedes goes off, a couple of half-tracks go off, headed toward the terminal. They said from the time that the wheels touched down, and, and they fooled the Ugandans completely. They thought they, they thought they were commercial airliners. From the time the wheels touched down till the time the terrorists were eliminated and They'd secured the hostages, it just took five minutes. Um, this guy told me that, uh, and he was really a funny guy because 
he's, he's a very average looking guy. You know, when I talked to him, he was 50. He didn't, nothing exceptional about him at all. And he was laughing. He said a few years before they'd had some kind of retrospective about the operation on Israeli TV. He said they were interviewing all kinds of people. Of course, they didn't interview him. <laughs> and uh, he said this, this woman that uh, had been rescued, uh, one of the guys had, had, one of the soldiers had just picked her up off the floor and started running toward a plane with her. And, and so the interviewer said, oh, you know, what was that like? What was he like? And she, she described him as, uh, she said, oh, he's like Clint Eastwood. He was just 6'4". <laughs> he was just big and strong and, you know, and this guy is 5'7", you know. <laughs> so, uh, so he had been selected. He was a 21-year-old sergeant. He was going to be mustered out of the Army in one week, and he volunteered to go. It was an all-volunteer mission. Netanyahu didn't have to go. In fact, the brass didn't want him to go. And he said, no, I have to be there. The men have to see that I'm there, and I, I need to see that everything's unfolding properly. And so uh, this guy that I, I visited with, uh, he, he said that, you know, he was selected to go in the door first. And he said, I had five kilos of, of explosives on my back because they didn't know if they'd have to blow the door open or not. They didn't know if the door would be open or closed. It, it was open. <laughs> and he had a megaphone because he said we had, to, we had to tell the hostages what was going on. They were completely, of course, can you imagine? It's in the middle of the night, and it was men, women, and children. And they're sleeping on the floor, and it's three minutes after midnight. So everybody's sound asleep, or, you know, close. And so he was going to have to use this megaphone to, they yelled where the Israeli army, stay down, stay down. And then he said, I had my weapon. And um, so he gets in the doorway. And there was a German terrorist laying on the floor just a few feet inside with a rifle. And he raised his rifle, and he fired at Amir first. And Amir said, I could feel bullets and glass going past my head and neck, and nothing hit me. And he fired a burst and killed, killed this person. And uh, another guy went in directly behind him, one turned to the right, one turned to the left, and he said they fired 60 rounds in that room in 15 seconds and killed all the terrorists. They had to find two of them that were running out a side door, and they eliminated them. And then they, they immediately started loading these people on the planes. And, you know, you can just imagine, you don't even know what's going on, because nobody was coming to rescue them. These people knew they were alone, see, they were completely alone and defenseless. You're alone and defenseless in your situation in your life now. They were alone and defenseless. And they were going to be murdered. And they said that when the, the shooting started, the parents of the children started throwing their coats and blankets over their kids because just instinctively you want to stop the bullets. And so um, they got everybody on board, and uh, they had the, also the foresight to, uh, they, they blew up every Ugandan plane on the tarmac so they couldn't be followed. And uh, Ehud Barak was in charge of that operation. Now, he may have become a stupid politician a generation later, a disaster as a politician, but on the battlefield, he was, he was a hero. And so they got back in the air, and they had discovered that uh, Netanyahu had been hit. And at the end of the day, he was the only casualty. He was the only Israeli soldier killed. He had stepped out in the plaza in front of the terminal building, and there was a uh, street light. And he, he wanted to see 
that they were the operation was unfolding correctly, and he he was exposed to uh, they think a Ugandan soldier shot him, and he was killed. And uh, but the operation was a complete success, and. Uh, I don't believe that it could have come off at all if the Lord wasn't with them. It just doesn't make any sense. Everything went right. All of this crazy stuff had to unfold in the proper way. The terrorists never knew they were coming until they were literally right upon them. Um... This, uh, this guy, Amir, uh, told me that about a year after the raid, he was in Tel Aviv one afternoon with some buddies of his, and they were just standing on the street corner shooting the breeze. And uh, uh, pretty soon a girl that they all knew came walking up to them, and... So, she, you know, she's listening. And, and so pretty soon, one of Amir's friends started telling this girl what Amir had done at Entebbe. Well, you have to understand, you know, in that year, every Israeli soldier in, in the country told girls that he'd been to Entebbe, all right? <laughs> it was a pickup line, you know? So all million of them, I guess, had gone in those four planes. Now, Amir is a very quiet, unassuming guy. And in fact, nobody knows what he did except people that know him very closely to this day. And so, he, you know, he's a very unassuming guy. But he said this girl got really upset. And he was a little startled by that. And she turned and she looked right at him and she said, you know, Five guys this year have told me that they went to Entebbe. And this really makes me mad. She said, you shouldn't be doing things like this. That's not, that's not good. She said, this is upsetting. And she turned and, and storms away. And he said, you know, normally I wouldn't have said anything. But he said, I just couldn't leave it that way. He said, I just felt so bad. So he called out to her. And this is what he said. He said, just inside the entrance to the left was a set of French doors. And the carpet was green. And you were lying on the right side. She had been the hostage that he had thrown over his shoulder and rescued. Isn't that exactly how God comes to us? You're completely alone and vulnerable. And there's no way out for you. And there's not going to be a way out for you. But then God shows up and he rescues you. And he takes you out of peril. the God of the Bible, the God that did all those things for the Jewish people, who was with them in modern times in the War of Independence, in the Six-Day War, Osiric and Tebi, the Yom Kippur War, is the same God that will come to you in your hour of need every time. Thank you very much. Um, let's have a word of prayer and then uh, Pastor will come up. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today um, to speak to these wonderful people. And this has blessed me so much to be able to be with them. And I just ask, Lord, that we, each of us, always remember that no matter our circumstances, you are always there, always there to put us in the flat of the rock. 
I ask that you bless these people as they go about their days this week and always remind them of your love for them. In Jesus' name, amen.